I was on a training run and uh, I slipped on some, I some ice. Instead of uh, falling down like anyone else would do, I sort of I hyperextended my knee and uh, I went to see the doctors. We tried to rehab it for a while. It was decided that I had to have surgery, so I did. Uh, had the surgery, uh, came out of surgery. My wife noticed something was a little off. However, the doctor still thought that I was okay to go home, sent me home. Weren't you turning a little blue? I was blue and that's uh, the reason for the concern. However, the doctor still sent me home and 14 hours later, I had a massive stroke. Uh, I was rushed to the hospital and uh, in which I was having another stroke at that time. So it was just a very bad situation, uh, a very scary situation. While I was laying on the stretcher in the, uh, in the emergency ward, uh, you know, being hooked up to all these devices, uh, I could feel uh, myself, uh, you know, there was something wrong, terribly wrong. And the doctor was telling my wife that the chances are that I wouldn't survive until the morning. And uh, I, I knew that, as I said, something was terribly wrong. And my last audible words were not to the doctors to help me or to my wife to, that I loved her, but my last audible words were, sweet Jesus, save me. And uh, at that moment, an incredible peace came upon me. And I heard somebody, as if somebody was standing right in front of me saying, you will be well. And that peace just magnified and I couldn't begin to describe how that felt. But I just gave myself over to it. I trusted in the words that I heard and uh, even at that point, when I said that, all the monitors started beeping and clicking and the doctors started looking at things and they revised their prognosis that uh, if I did survive till morning, chances are I would never walk again, I would never talk again, uh, that my wife would most likely end up feeding me my meals. Uh, so it was a very, uh, very scary situation. What a drama. <laughs> There's so many layers to this. I mean, you called out to Jesus had you had any dealings with Jesus in your life? Uh, really not, not a lot. Uh, we went to Sunday school as children. My parents took us to Sunday school. But other than that, I had no connection with church or God. I knew of God. I knew of Christ because of being in Sunday school. But other than that, so it was really a, a unusual for me to call to God, especially at that point. I remember Your my, wife said, why did you say that? She said that the next day. She said, why did you say that? I said, I have no idea why I said that. It was just, it just came out. How wonderful. Uh, and I knew that something had changed at that point. It was. And you actually heard the words, you will be well. I heard the words, you will be well. It was just like we're talking right now. You're, you're just, you, if you said to me, you would be well. I heard those words as clear as... Goodness, and you, you felt you were dying. You thought this is it. It is very terrifying when you're laying there and your body is going cold and you know you, you cannot move a part of your body when your mind is trying to tell your body to do something and it doesn't. It is a very scary thing. And I, when you feel your body going cold and you hear the doctor saying you're not going to survive, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it is not a very good situation to be in for anyone. And uh, that's, that's the reason what's remarkable that I didn't tell my wife that I loved her, that I just said, I just called out to God. God has put eternity in every heart. That, there's that intuitive knowing. There's something beyond. Well, I, I love that you got back walking again, actually. Uh, the doctors must have been stunned. And something very unusual about your walks. Where, where did you find yourself landing? Well, when I was able to walk, I would, uh, go out of the house because they wanted me to exercise and keep the muscles going. So I would, every time I'd stop and look up, I'd be in front of a church. <laughs> Even when I purposely went out and said, I am not gonna stop in front of a church, I would stop, I'd look up, there was a church. Uh, God had really interesting ways of drawing you into a relationship that you didn't really know yet, but the change in you, uh, at the time, you had three companies, visual arts, fashion, and hair industry. You got into TV commercials and programming. Mm -hmm. uh, the vice president of Revlon was a little shocked at the new Charles that he saw. He was. They were so used to me yelling and screaming when I was doing all this production work that uh, they felt if I wasn't yelling and screaming, it wasn't going to be a good show. And I was so calm, and he came up to me and said, I'm really bothered by the fact that you're not yelling at anyone. And I said, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. And they had <laughs> a fabulous... It'll still be good. <laughs> it'll still be good. Actually, they had a better show than I was even anticipating, so it really worked out well for them. Through all of this, you, you never lost confidence, even though you were a very fledgling believer, despite the doctor's prognoses. Well, I, I put my faith in the voice that I heard, and I knew it had to be God and my complete trust is in him. I have my faith is in his faithfulness that he will honor his word. 
and he's honored his word every time. So when it came to any time hearing the doctors what they said was going to happen to me, even though I understood what they were saying to me, my faith was still in what God can do for me, not what medical science can do. Because every time I listen to them, according to them, I should not be here right now. I guess, I guess. Okay. Um, 1994, you had a collapsed airway. 1995 to 96, you had three TIAs, mini strokes. 98, we got to stop here for a second because you went to Bible college where you had a third massive stroke. Yes, yeah, so it was. Uh, I, I knew something was wrong. I, I went to the dean of students and said that I, I, I needed to go to the hospital. And he said, okay. And I ended up in the hospital in Toronto. And uh, while I was there, they uh, confirmed that I was having another massive stroke and I was admitted into hospital. Uh, what was normal for me because there was always this conflict between uh, whether there's a hole in my heart or not a hole in my heart. And this is what this kept this going on and on. So um, I was sent for imaging because they would, imaging would show the cloud of my brain or the wedge of my brain. They would see the, follow the path of the blood clots. Uh, but because uh, cardiology couldn't find a hole, this was, this was a, a reason for concern and why the debate went on. So there so, was a real cool nurse there, right? There was. I was wheeled into imaging. I was there for a while and she said, he's there far too long. So she pulled my chart and she walked over to me and she said, you've had a rough go of it. And I said, well, yeah. And she said, well, I've been looking for your, through your chart here and I noticed that of all the tests that your doctors have ordered, nobody's ever ordered a bubble test. And she said, do you know what that is? And I said, no, I don't know what that is. And she said, well, with your permission, I'd like to do it, but I need a doctor. So she went and got a doctor. They explained to me they were gonna pump saline into my heart, doing an ultrasound at the same time. And if there was a hole, this would show it because we'll see a steady stream of bubbles going from one side of the heart to the other. So they explained it. They started pushing the saline into my body, and sure enough, a steady stream of bubbles from one side of my heart to the other. This is a game changer. Well, then 2000, you had a mini stroke, and they discovered that hole had got smaller. Your surgery was canceled. Mm -hmm. 2003, they found a tumor the size of a golf ball in your chest. That was a whole new game, a tumor. It was. It was uh, a total shock to me. I was actually, every year I had to go through testings because of the stroke. So I would go through a massive uh, amount of tests, MRIs, uh, Take uh, blood work. Take us to the parking lot. So I get the x-ray, the doctor had asked me to get the x-ray for him because they found this tumor. So I'm in the parking lot of the hospital because they asked me to get my x-rays. I'm sitting in my car, I held the x-ray up to my windshield. It's all marked for surgery. It's already. all marked for surgery and it's a different thing to, to hear about it. It's another thing to see it. So there it was and I just started praying to God. As I'm praying, I had this vision of God's hand reaching into my chest and grabbing hold of the tumor and pulling it out of my body. So I went to the hospital, finished uh, to go through another battery of tests, pre-surgical, and they stopped and they asked me to see my family doctor the next day, which I did. And when I did, she walked into the office and she looked at me and she said, Charles, I don't know how to explain this to you, but you have another miracle. They cannot find that tumor. Your wife had to ask you to please stop carrying the x-ray around as a show and tell. I, listen, I'd be doing the same thing. Just stunning. Uh, you know what? I, I just have to jump. 2005, you had another tumor. Uh, 2008, um, some heart problems. They discovered the hole in your heart was gone. A medical impossibility, the doctor said. He said because of the, the speed at which your blood travels through your body, which is about 60 miles per hour, and for your heart to stop long enough, and if there was a flap of skin or something else to block the hole, for your heart to stop that long, your blood not to do that, it's just an impossibility of the hole actually closing itself, which it did. There's, there's not calcium or anything else around. It's actually tissue over the hole. Psalm 30, verse 2, your favorite verse. Oh, yeah. Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. Someone's watching right now, terminally ill, and they're saying, I only need one miracle. He got 12. What do you say to them? I say, place your trust in God and his promises. Totally trust him. Not, you're going to hear things from the doctors, you're going to hear the diagnosis, you're going to hear a prognosis, but take it to the great physician. Give it to God. Put it in his hands. He's very capable and just trust him. He will find a way, he will make a way, and it will happen. I truly believe that. What do you need faith to believe God for today? You know, before Charles even knew the Lord, he was experiencing his peace in the trial. There's power and agreement 
Our prayer partners are here for you. Why not call right now? Let us pray with you, believe with you. 1-800-273-5433.